Okay, I got a little sun, so let's go on. The uh, Constitution creates a government of delegated and enumerated powers, but despite the popular term states' rights, no government, federal, state, country, or local actually possesses any rights at all. Recall from the Declaration of Independence that persons are endowed with unalienable rights. Governments possess only power, which in legitimate governments are derived from the consent of the governed. That's us. In particular, governments have only those powers that are given to them or delegated to them by us, the people. Now, the de delegation of powers to government and a written agreement as to the extent and limits of those powers are critical elements of a limited constitutional government. Article 4 requires that every state give its full faith and credit. And we're just lightly going over these articles right now. To the laws and decisions of every other state and that citizens of each state enjoy all privileges and immunities of citizenship in every other state. Both of which are conducive to establishing the rule of law. Article 5 provides a process for amending the Constitution, making changes to it. Here we see the American concept that the Constitution is a fundamental law that can be changed, thus allowing for constitutional reform and adaptation, but only by popular decision-making process and not by ordinary legislation or judicial decree. Now, Article 6 ensures that the America's legal system, especially the federal and state courts, is centered on the United States Constitution. It begins by recognizing the debts that existed prior to the Constitution which is to say it recognizes that the United States existed before the United States Constitution. More important, it makes the Constitution and the laws and treaties made pursuant to it the supreme law of the land. And then finally, Article 7 bans religious tests for office and instead binds all federal and state office holders by oath to the Constitution. Article 8 requires the Constitution to be ratified by state conventions rather than state legislatures, again pointing to the document's legitimacy and the sovereignty of the people acting in their state capacity. In addition, in addition to the formal provisions of the document, there are three important but understand mechanisms at work in the Constitution. The extended republic, the separation of powers, and federalism. These auxiliary precautions constitute improvements in the science of politics developed by the founders and form the basis of what they called in the Federalist Number 10 a Republican remedy for the diseases most incident to Republican government. They understood that they had problems, but they worked to try to find ways in which to solve those problems. Now, increasing the size of the nation would take in a great number and variety of opinions, making it harder for a majority to form on narrow interests contrary to the common good. 
The founders also knew, as Madison explained in the Federalist No. 48, that the accumulation of all powers legislative, executive, and judish, judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary and self-appointed or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. See, they, again, that word tyranny, and we get so close to that in today's um, government. In order to distribute power and prevent its accumulation, and that's what they want to do, they want the supreme power, but in order to distribute power and prevent its accumulation, they created three separate branches of government. Now, those who had concluded that the government under Articles of Confederation was weak and ineffective, who had advocated a convention to substitute substantially rework the structure of the national government and who had then supported the new constitution were called federalists. While those opposed changing that structure and then opposed the ratification of the new constitution became known as anti-federalists. Made up of diverse elements and various individuals, the anti-federalists generally held that the only way to have limited government and self-reliant citizens was through a small republic, and they believed that the Constitution gave too much power to the federal government relative to the states. They were especially suspicious of executive power, fearing that the presidency would evolve into a monarchy over time. At the same time, they warned that the judicial tyranny stemming from the creation of independent life-tenured judges, while the anti-federalists failed to prevent ratification of the Constitution, their efforts led directly to the creation of the first ten amendments of the Constitution. Many of their concerns and warnings, whether or not they justified opposition to the Constitution, were present in light of modern changes in American constitutionalism. So they still listened to what they had to say. They um, still cared about, you know, what they were saying. And that looks like it has you for today. Um, I will... Uh, see you again next week as we can continue on. And yes, I we're slowly getting to where we're going to actually start on um, the Constitution itself. I just think that this is really important to know how they derived it. It makes us understand it a little bit better as we get there. So thank you and see you later.